Perfect. All right, so I'm Malia Lorenz, and I'm here with Mrs. Klein, Kirsten Klein, the music teacher. But I, you can go ahead and introduce yourself if you want. Hi, right, my name is Kirsten Klein. I am the choir teacher at Benzie Central Schools in Benzie County in Michigan. Um, I guess that's it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so school has been closed for over two months now, but what were your first thoughts going into it when we thought that we were going to come back? Um, I really thought it would be exciting to get to come back. I think, you know, everybody likes having a little break. Um, you know, it's always nice to feel like you come back and you're really refreshed and, and just kind of the feeling I got from the community and from students was that they would be very excited and we're looking forward to coming back. And I think that was just kind of a big uh, letdown for a lot of people to feel like we were losing that sense of community and, and school and not being able to see everybody. Right. Um, so now kind of moving into your teaching. So as the vocal director of the Benzie Spring Musical Into the Woods, how did you feel about the call to cancel the shows? It was definitely a tough call. Um, if we would have been a week earlier, I think we would have been okay and we could have performed. Um, and I really think if we could have had every performance, it would have been one of the best shows that Benzie has done in a really long time and that's what makes it so completely bittersweet because it would have been an amazing performance but I'm thankful and happy we at least got to do it once. Right, right. So as a choir and theater teacher what kind of adjustments have you made with your teaching to online school I mean? Well our content has changed drastically in the sense of we're not performing together, we're not creating together, we're not making music um, and that's a big hit to I think just my students in general, because that's one big thing they love about the class and to myself, because that's why I teach what I teach is my content area. Um, but it's really interesting to get to dive into some other aspects of music and music history and theory and literacy and things that we don't necessarily always get to do during a normal school year. So I feel like we're getting to learn music through other avenues, which is beneficial. So what kind of ways are you doing the online schooling? Well, we've got um, some like in different assignments, you mean, like examples? Yeah, kind of, okay. yeah. Like just kind of how, um, I guess if you could explain a little bit on how the lessons that you've done through online schooling have been, or like what they consist of and everything, what you're asking of the students. So a lot of lessons I think have been really self-motivated and self-directed by students. I kind of just give the outline of what the expectations are and what um, they should be looking at. And then it's really up to the student to get as creative as they want to with completing the assignment. So that's really nice because some, some of the assignments speak to other students and, and depending on what they are, and then it's good to see their creative side somewhere else besides performing. Right. So how are your students responding to this kind of teaching? <clears throat> For my class, I think students are responding fairly well. Um, we've been trying to keep the content very simple in general so everybody doesn't feel very overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I'm lucky enough that I've had a good number of students who are still participating and still active and want to be active in the class. Good. So what is your biggest priority as a teacher right now? Just trying to support my students however I can. Um, it doesn't even have to have anything to do with music. We've got students who are all over um, the map and Benzie uh, economically, geographically. I mean, it's just, we've got students who have so many different needs and I just wanna make sure that they understand that it's not about doing homework. It's about making sure that they're safe, they're taken care of and they have the support that they need. So what were you looking forward to most with school that you now have to miss out on because of the coronavirus? Um, concerts, <laughs> you know, and festival. We didn't get to do State Choral Festival, which we've never gone to before, and I would have loved to do that, and State Soul and Ensemble, and our Pops concert, which I'm sure you are missing as well as a senior. Um, it's just those moments that you feel like you've been robbed of that you're not gonna get back. Or if you try to figure out a way to make it work, it's just never going to be the same. But um, I guess you find some sort of weird comfort in the fact that you're not the only one that's going through it. You're not the only school. 
it's happening to a lot of people right now. And it's just kind of the sacrifice that you have to make. So are there any plans to make up for anything that you're missing out on in the future? Um, well, we're trying to figure out graduation and creating a graduation video and performances that way, just in case we are not able to have our live graduation. Um, I still want to get the senior class together at some point so um, they can do their music notes in the classroom because that's important. That's a rite of passage too. So something like that. We've talked, teachers have talked a little bit about, you know, prom or what do we want to do to invite seniors back so they feel like they're part of it. Um, and even next year's concert, seeing if there's an option we can throw something in, something into that. So it's just not a complete wash. Right. So has the COVID situation changed the way that you look at your day-to-day -day life and your job? Um, I think it definitely has at this point in my life being pregnant and home with a toddler while I'm trying to teach at the same time. It's, I definitely feel like I can't go out and do things like I normally would to go to the store or even go to doctor's appointments. So it's really kind of mind boggling to me just to realize how you kind of take little things like that for granted. And I also feel that where we are in Benzie County, um, we're not seeing it as much as other communities are. I mean, even if you go to Lansing or Grand Rapids in Detroit, we definitely are not feeling the effects. So it's really hard, I think, for us too, to kind of wrap our heads around what is, what is actually happening. Right. So what do you hope that your students gain from this situation? Um, I hope they gain some compassion and empathy for everybody, <laughs> no matter where they're from or what they're doing or what their their job is in the world right now. Um, and just maybe a little bit of grace and patience to realize how hard everybody's trying to adjust to a new way of life. Um, and just to be thankful for the things that they do have. And I'm, I've, I've seen that through a lot of students in the past couple of weeks, and that's been something really nice to see. Great. So has this situation brought about any new connections among the staff at Benzie? I think it's definitely made the staff a, more close-knit, tighter than it was, because we're all trying to navigate and figure this out together, and we rely heavily on each other. When we're in the building, um, and now it's like this is completely uncharted territory. And so just to have each other to kind of talk to and lean on and say, hey, what are you doing for this? Or how are you doing this? And just to hear what everybody's doing and to, um, you know, feed off of each other and support each other is really important. Absolutely. So what are your thoughts on how Benzie has handled the situation? Um, I... I don't know if it could have been handled any better or any differently because it's so hard to say um, what was going to happen. I mean, this is uncharted. The word I hate that is being used over and over again is, is, is unprecedented and I'm, I'm so tired of that vocabulary word, um, but it's true. Um, I think being transparent and having open communication is very, very important. And I think for the most part, the school district has done a really good job of that with staff and students. Um, there's a couple things I probably wouldn't have come out and said right away if I was in the shoes of a leader, but um, you know, you learn from making those mistakes too, for if it were ever, ever to happen again in our lifetime of, okay, now this is, we wanna handle this situation differently. What are the, any, are there any um, notable or admirable things that Benzie has done that you'd like to point out? I think number one would definitely be the food service it is a huge contribution to our community. You know, delivering meals to children in Benzie County who are birth to 18 years of age, regardless of if they are a student or at our school or not. Um, that's a huge savings for a lot of families and a relief for a lot of families. And I think that's something that has been really well done. And I know the district has plans to um, continue something along those lines over the summer, probably not delivering, but at least to offer our families, you know, meals and food is really important. Um, and I think as far as offering devices for students who don't have devices, um, 
to try to participate in online learning, trying to mail paperwork out to students who have no access to internet. I feel like there's a lot of ways the district has tried to um, really reach out to families and keep them connected and not feel like, okay, well, we're only doing online. If you don't have online learning, I guess you're just not gonna have any learning. Um, so I think there's a lot of things like that that have been very admi admirable and accepted by the community. So what advice would you give to your fellow teachers making adjustments to the rest of the, or for the rest of the school year? Um, just to give yourself as much grace and patience as you are allowing to your students at this time. A lot of us are still trying to get used to teaching at home while we have our own kids here or while you're trying to teach your own kids who are learning online. And it is definitely a learning curve for everybody. So just as much as we are checking in on our students and their well-being, don't forget to check in on yourself. Absolutely. So what advice would you give to struggling students in this time? Um, if you have a teacher or a mentor or an adult that you feel safe talking to, to reach out to them. It doesn't even have to be anything about school. If you feel like you are missing that person you would talk to every day, um, do what you can to see if you can get a hold of them or write them a letter or give them a phone call. I think a lot of teachers are really missing those, um, you know, those relationship building things that we get to do at school. And um, a lot of students are too. So if that's something that you are missing right now, don't be afraid to reach out to somebody. So now kind of moving into more towards home life in Penzi County, uh, how has the coronavirus situation changed your life at home with your family? Um, well, we are currently in a complete renovation of our home <laughs> that went uh, to a standstill when everything kind of started. So that was a big, um, a big stressor for us because our goal was to be in our home by now because I'm supposed to have a baby in three weeks. So, and we're not, <laughs> and it's, it is what it is. We're just learning a great lesson in patience. Mm -hmm. So that's been a big stressor in our life, um, which makes it sound like I have some serious first world problems because I'm worried about my house not being done and people have greater worries right now. So I'm definitely thankful that we have somewhere to stay and we have a roof over our head. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the big thing for us right now. So how did you explain the situation to your son? Well, Caleb is three, so he doesn't really... So it hasn't, his life hasn't changed much? Well, he's, he's at home with me instead of going to my sister-in-law's for daycare. So he's just really enjoying the at-home time. Um, and sometimes he'll say, Nana's home, Nana's home. Like, are we going to go to auntie's home, auntie's house? And no, we're not. But, you know, he's just in his own little bubble, enjoying, enjoying the mom and dad time. So would you say he's responding well to the situation then? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. That's good. So I know you talked about it a little bit before, but if you could elaborate on any extra precautions that being pregnant during this time that you had to, like, take on and everything. Um... When, well, let's see, I had an appointment maybe a week or two into the initial shutdown and I talked to my OB about it, you know, what do I need to do or what if we go back to school, different things. And she said, it's, you know, you just like anybody else, you need to be cautious. You're not any more high risk than <clears throat> any other adult right now. Um, she said your immune system is slightly compromised just because you are pregnant, but you should be okay. So a big thing would be like, you know, shopping. I'm not perusing Target looking for baby items like I normally probably would be. Um, you know, I'm ordering groceries online. I'm not going into the stores, wearing a mask in public. Um, so just things like that that feel kind of really awkward and strange to get used to doing. Um, and we took the first, you know, I don't even know how long we've been. <laughs> in our stay home, stay safe. Probably the first two months we took it very seriously and you know, didn't have, didn't have people over, didn't go over to anybody else's house. And now probably within the last week, we've been a little more relaxed with it, with if we have visitors, um, you know, we still try to keep a distance, but no hugging, no, no 
uh, no kisses, no hugs, no affection, nothing, you know, anything like that with grandma and grandpa, things like that. So still just trying to play it safe. Right. So how are you uh, handling the fears that have been coming from the pandemic? Um, there's a lot of information out there in the world, and I think you have to be intelligent enough to sift through it and decide what you are going to believe and what you think really affects your life and what is attempting to create fear in your life. Um, this whole pandemic and stay home order is really only as bad as you make it. Um, I mean, you have to decide if you're going to try to see the positive in the situation or if you're going to get hung up on it and say, oh, well, I can't go to the store. I can't go do this. I can't go anywhere. Well, you can go outside. You can go in your yard. You can go for a walk. You can get sunshine. You can go to the store, but yeah, you have to wear a mask. You know, the store, to me, I feel like the store is allowed to make that choice. Just like they say, you need to wear a shirt or you need to wear shoes. So I don't see people lining up at Costco upset because they have to wear shoes into a store. You know, it's to protect you and to protect others. Um, so it is sad to kind of see some of the big divides it's created um, in people and just not, not using the brain, not thinking about it um, and letting fear really take over. Mm -hmm. So Benzie County was one of the last counties in the lower peninsula to get the corona or to get confirmed cases of the virus. Do you think that reason is because of our size as a county or do you think it goes beyond that? Um, I think some of it might be. We're a fairly large county and we have a lot of people that are spread out all over the place. Um, and I also think we have a lot of people who don't necessarily work in Benzie County. They live here, but don't they don't work here. Um, but I also wouldn't be surprised if we had confirmed cases months ago and nobody knew it. Right. So I think it's like that in a lot of places. I think if people were tested in January or February, we may have seen that they actually had the virus. And it's just, we didn't have access to the tests. We didn't have the knowledge of the virus and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on Benzie County's response to the virus? Um, I would have liked to see more notice from the health department sooner. Um, I relied heavily on information from Grand Traverse Health Department at first, and some of that might be because we didn't have the cases, but I would have liked to see more front loading from them as to what was going on. So, uh, what are your thoughts about the protests in Lansing and in other states as well? Um, I think it's absolutely ridiculous. I think that, um, I think that kind of shows how some people are letting fear take over their ability to think clearly and assess the situation. Um, and I think it also shows how much people let their political affiliation affect their choices, um, you know, because hmm, I don't want to word this. <laughs> um, I think a lot of the protests that are going on are people who agree with our governor because she does not fit their party lines. She does not fit their gender. She does not fit their agenda um, of whatever they think should be done. And I also think that she didn't make all of these decisions 100% her, by herself. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to see what would happen if some of these individuals would um, be in her shoes and have to make these decisions and what would they do? So um, yeah, it's really disappointing. I would understand a peaceful protest where you don't agree with something and you're out there maybe with a sign or you're still trying to keep social distancing, um, but things like that weren't happening, and that was really disappointing to see adults acting like that. So do you have anything to, to say to your local businesses or essential workers? Um, I think our essential workers are anybody that's doing whatever they can 
to try to keep afloat right now um, are healthcare workers, um, people in the grocery store, people in convenience stores, people working at gas stations, teachers trying to work from home. I think all of us are realizing how essential we are and um, I think that's really important that we support all of those individuals. I also hope that local businesses are able to stay afloat, but to make a decision um, for this weekend that they are comfortable and confident in making and don't feel like they have to open early because they're nervous they're gonna have to shut down. So I think it's kind of, this is the weird sort of Petri dish experiment to see what's gonna happen now. Everybody's kind of waiting to see um, what the effects are gonna be now. So also kind of going off of that, what are your thoughts about um, Benzie County being one of the places in Michigan that can reopen this weekend? Um, I think it's, I think it's okay. I think, um, taking it one step at a time very slowly is important. And the other part of the aspect is a lot of people are going to be really worried because we are such a tourist destination that, um, you know, once the floodgates open and we have a lot of tourists and people that are here, that's something our economy relies heavily on. Um, which is great that we have that prospect to happen here in a couple of weeks, but I also think it's we really need to be careful about what could happen. Absolutely. So now kind of moving into our final thoughts of the interview, what has been the best part of quarantine for you personally? Um, I'm, I'm wearing pants. I'm just not wearing real pants. <laughs> so that would probably be a big one. Just getting to wear like yoga pants and kind of chill out a little bit. Um, that not setting my alarm for five o'clock in the morning is really great. Um, and um, I think I found a new appreciation for myself of not feeling like I have to do my hair and makeup every day, which has been super nice. Where it's like, oh, this is okay. I could, I can maybe get used to this a little bit. Um, so all very selfish things, so. So what has been the worst thing though? Um, just feeling like if I wanted to go somewhere, which I know I can go somewhere, but just not necessarily going, just leaving and getting in the car and not planning for it, you know what I mean? Just, oh, I'm gonna go do this and now I feel like I have to take a little more time to plan out my day if I'm going to be out and about and what I'm going to go do. Did you read all that? Okay. So things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So the hope for the future could end up being very different from the reality, but what do you hope the future will look like when this is over or what do you hope the world will look like when this is over? I should say. Um, I hope everybody's just a little more kind and patient with each other. Just a minute. We'll get some more. So I, I really hope that that's kind of the outcome that everybody's, you know, you see somebody on the street that you don't know when you even just say hi or hello to them because it's, oh my gosh, you're actually seeing somebody out in public. So, and being kind and understanding. So now moving away from our hopes, what do you think the world will look like after this? Um... I don't know. <laughs> I think some areas it might be that fuzzy warm feeling for a little bit and then I think eventually it's going to go away because everybody will kind of fall into their normal routine. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think there's some people who probably are just not going to recover from it emotionally, socially, financially, and it's going to be tough. Absolutely. So how do you think the situation will change schooling when fall rolls around? Um, there's been a lot of different conversations about what school is going to look like. And I think every community is different. Um, we're thankful up here that we have not been hit as heavily as other communities. So I think our chances of having a possible normal school year and traditional, I guess, in the classroom could be, you know, highly likely. 
not to put words in any administrator's mouth because nothing has come out yet, but um, so I know a lot of schools in different areas have announced that they'll be back, but their class sizes are gonna be severely reduced or they're gonna do online to start or they're gonna do a hybrid and you kind of alternate days. So, <clears throat> but I think it shows if we have to do online, we, we can do it. Um, having a little more time to plan would be great. <laughs> yeah. So what is the first thing that you're going to do post quarantine besides having your baby, of course? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, after I have the baby and it's post quarantine and maybe like July <laughs> or August, I just want to go to like a winery <laughs> and have a glass of wine and sit outside and feel like, oh, this is nice. Um, yeah, just, or go to, you know, take my kid to the park, you know, or go to the beach, things like that, that we love to do in the summer. All right. So now for the final question, could you describe your quarantine experience in one word? Surreal. <laughs> That's a good one. I never would have thought of that. All right. But thank you so much for doing this interview with me, Mrs. Klein. You're welcome, Leah. I didn't stop recording.